Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Abin Sharibadi. On behalf of Monday Night IBD, our faculty, and CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us tonight for our first Monday Night IBD live symposium, addressing the cases that challenge your practice. Today's activity is certified by CME Outfitters. We were very lucky to partner with them. This is an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. And uh, this activity actually was inspired by Monday Night IBD, which is a uh, Twitter handle. So if you're not on Twitter, I really encourage you to start uh, a, your own handle and follow the amazing faculty we have tonight. Follow Monday Night IBD. Dr. Uma Mahadevan, Dr. Miguel Ruggiero, and follow CME Outfitters to stay up to date on uh, education activities that are available. So today's activity was, is meant to be interactive uh, and uh, we are all respecting physical distancing so we can stay safe, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't connect. So this is really meant for us to connect and discuss together how to best manage our patients with inflammatory bowel disease, the patient that we see in, in our practice. So we really want to hear from you during this webinar. Throughout the webinar, we'll be posting clinical vignettes with a poll. Uh, these vignettes are inspired from real life uh, cases. And uh, we really want you to answer the poll. Let's get started. So let me first introduce you to our faculty tonight. Again, I'm Alin Sharabadi, Clinical Director of Gastroenterology and Director of the IBD Center at John Hopkins Memorial Hospital in Washington, DC. And I would like now to welcome our panel. First, uh, I would like to introduce my good friend and IBD um, star and fashionista, Dr. Uma Mahadevan. Dr. Mahadevan is professor of medicine and co-director of uh, the UCSF Center for Colitis and Crohn's Disease, as well as the director of Advanced IBD Fellowship and chief of GI faculty practice at the University of California, San Francisco. Uma, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Aline. It's wonderful to have a small piece of DDW this year. Uh, thank you. I'm glad we got to wear our fancy shirts today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next, uh, we are also joined today by my very good friend and amazing supporter of women uh, in GI and women in IBD and a wonderful mentor, Dr. Miguel Ruggiero. Dr. Rodero is a professor and chair of the Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, as well as the Pierre and Renee Bora Family Endowed Chair of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Miguel, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Great. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Aileen. It's a pleasure. It's great to see Monday Night Live come to this platform. Sorry, I couldn't be at DDW, but it's kind of neat as I watch you. You're actually on my Twitter feed at the same time, so this is very cool. So everybody out there, get ready to Twitter. This is going to be very interactive. People are already starting to go crazy, so that's wonderful. Uh, no, I'm not wearing red, and as somebody tweeted out today, yes, I'm wearing the same blue blazer for the last 25 IBDs, uh, DDWs, I should say, so... You are correct. The men are not as fashionable as the women, but maybe that will be for a future Monday night. But it's a pleasure being here. I look forward to an engaging hour and a lot of fun. Thank you, Miguel. Next time we'll do a fashion uh, hour before any before our <laughs> webinar. But you're looking great. Uh, red or no red, you're looking fantastic. So uh, let's go over our learning objective today. The first one is to apply efficacy, safety, and comparative effectiveness data to optimize therapy selection for patients with IBD. Two is to identify appropriate treatment strategy for IBD patients uh, during this COVID-19 endemic, and also in special population like the elderly and pregnant women and women who are breastfeeding. And finally, our third objective is to develop strategies such as disease monitoring, shared decision-making, patient education to really achieve optimal patient outcome. So first, a, a little introduction for those of you uh, on our webinar and who are not familiar with Monday Night IBD. Uh, just a little bit of historic. The Monday Night IBD is the inspiration behind this program. Uh, and uh, if you are new to Twitter or have never tweeted, and you thought that Twitter was only for politicians and stars and the Kardashians, uh, you were right until a few years ago. Uh, recently, Twitter has become a really fantastic way for physicians to connect, 
to share medical information, key scientific uh, papers, and lesson learned at major GI meetings. And this is what we call Med Twitter now. And Monday Night IBD is a handle that was created a year ago around DDW time. So this is our one year anniversary and it's a fantastic way to celebrate with all of you. And this handle was uh, created to promote discussions between clinicians from around the world and around challenging IBD cases. So every Monday, an IBD expert posts a clinical question uh, with a poll. Um, what would you do in this patient? And there's usually no right or wrong answer. It's really to trigger a discussion that highlights how we can approach the same case in a different way, as long as we can support it with scientific data and papers. And a lot of papers get shared during this uh, discussion to support everybody's point of view. And this is an open forum. Everyone is welcome. We have GI fellows, GI nurses, we have uh, gastroenterologists from private practice, from academic centers, IBD specialists, surgeons, nutritionists, psychologists. So everyone is welcome to participate. And the Twitter format really removed the constraint of time and space. So you can check in on the conversation when uh, you can on Monday night or even Tuesday morning, and then tweet your, uh, your uh, recommendation at your convenience. This is how uh, it looks like. This is how a conversation will look like. Uh, this is, uh, you can recognize Miguel and Uma's uh, tweet. Uh, Miguel did a fantastic, uh, very interactive case of how to approach a patient with Crohn's disease after reduction of the ileum, what should we do postoperatively? And Uma also led a very difficult case of a young woman with low-grade dysplasia who was planning pre uh, pre a pregnancy, what should we do? And, and you can see here how tweets will come in and different, uh, uh, different gastroenterologists uh, and different IBD experts will uh, interact and uh, give their opinions. What we also do is we really want to hear from our patients. Uh, we do feel that uh, listening to our IBD patient will help us better understand what is the patient experience and their perspective. So in midweek, we put up a patient poll uh, that really allows patients to tell us what they think about a particular pro uh, problem. problem. And then finally, at the end of the week, uh, we have an IBD algorithm master. And recently it's been Josh Steinberg, who is actually a GI fellow in third year fellowship and pursuing an IBD fellowship at the University of Chicago, who's been putting out wonderful IBD algorithm. What an IBD algorithm is, is really a nice summary of the discussion we had, the different points that were made, and uh, the data that we shared. So this is a nice segue then to start our uh, first case. Miguel, uh, you lead IBD Live every Thursday. It's a virtual conference now, and anybody can join in. And I really enjoy it, and I uh, learned so much about COVID-19 uh, by attending this uh, IBD Live virtual meeting every Thursday. So maybe you can walk us through this first case tonight. Great, well, thanks, Aileen. And thanks for the shout out for IBD Live as well. I think that um, we're in a new era of the virtual reality of education. So I applaud you for putting this on. But as you said, let's dive into the first case and get to some of the salient points. And I look forward to hearing from you and from Uma on your thoughts on this. So uh, this is a 51-year-old Caucasian man with Crohn's disease of the ileum for three years. He had previously been on infliximab but lost response due to anti-drug antibodies, so a pretty common scenario. He was then well controlled for two years on cetirlizumab pegol, uh, 400 milligram subcutaneous injection every four weeks and azathioprine 150 milligrams a day. He has heart disease and he has depression. So, so far, a pretty typical case. Um, during a virtual visit or a televisit, uh, whatever you call them at your institution, and I'm sure most of you out there have converted to the telemedicine platform. Um, and again, I think that's also here to stay. But he tells you on that, that televisit that he's concerned about the potential for COVID. So he asks some questions. Is he at increased risk for COVID-19 because of IBD, just because he has Crohn's disease? And he's also concerned, understandably, because he's on sertilizumab and azathioprine, and he knows that these have immune-modifying effects, he's worried what that means in this era of COVID. 
He's asking you, should he proceed with his next injection of ceratolizumab? And I'm sure many of you are asked these questions on your virtual visits. I can't get through a virtual visit without part of the discussion being around COVID. To complicate matters, his neighbor recently tested positive for COVID. And although James has not been in contact with his neighbor, he's understandably concerned. He himself has no respiratory symptoms, no GI symptoms, and again, he's feeling well on ceratolizumab and azathioprine. So at this point, I'll just recap the case, but you'll see the questions, uh, the question here and then the answers. And this will be our, our first audience response system and when we actually stop and, and want all of you to answer this. Some of you have already answered this on Twitter, but take a minute to answer this. So in recap, he's a 51-year-old Crohn's, previously on infliximab, lost response. Now he's doing very well on ceratolizumab and azathioprine. He's worried about COVID and his neighbor tested positive for COVID. He himself has no symptoms at all, no respiratory symptoms. So he's asking you at the televisit, what would you recommend? All right, so this was actually what Aileen had sent out the other day in Twitter, and these are the responses. So not from what you just competed, but from a, uh, a Twitter poll that she sent around a, a few days ago. So you can see here that 82.1% of those that were on the Twitter poll recommended staying on ceratolizumab and azathioprine, 16% would stop the azathioprine, but continue monotherapy ceratolizumab. Nobody would stop both and start budesonide. And only 1.9% would test for SARS-CoV-2, hold the medicines until the test comes back. So, you know, this might be a good time, uh, Aileen, for me to get some feedback from you and Uma on what you think about this poll. So Uma, Maybe I'll, I'll start with you and say, is this poll consistent with what you thought? Or are you surprised by anything? Yeah, so um, thank you, Miguel. I am surprised because I uh, think that many of us would consider dropping the azathioprine a little bit. This is a man over the age of 50 who's been doing well and he's on 150 milligrams. I think you have to take into account that he had antibodies to his prior anti-TNF um, anti agents, so the azathioprine is warranted. Uh, but what I have been doing in my practice and what also the International Organization of IBD talked about doing was considering in these combination therapy patients dropping the azathioprine dose or stopping it, even considering checking a level, though it's not as easy to get a sertolizumab level, but checking a level and if the levels are good to consider reducing or stopping azathioprine because that may confer more COVID risk than just um, sertolizumab alone. Okay, so very good option. Uh, we didn't actually give that to the audience about decreasing the, the dose of azathioprine, but Uma's appropriately saying, you know, maybe we should lower the azathioprine. Maybe that's what we worry about. Continue the sertolizumab alone or as you said, stop it all together. So I guess Uma, you would have chosen choice B or the second, Aileen. Yeah. And it did give you a down arrow, so you could stop or decrease. Okay, very it. good. Yeah, so I'm still learning Twitter. I don't know what all these symbols mean. So you guys tweet and like you use all these symbols and I just write words. So <laughs> spell it out for me. All right, so Aileen, what would you do? Do you agree with this? Would you do something differently? Yeah, I think this is a challenging question, actually, because I think you can really go both ways, in my opinion. Uh, you know, this is a patient who developed uh, antibody to uh, a first anti-TNF agent. So I do agree with the combination therapy with a second anti-TNF uh, to prevent developing antibodies. Um, but uh, typically, we do need a lower dose of azathioprine than the therapeutic dose to achieve that goal of preventing antibodies. So I agree with Uma that we may be able to decrease the dose of azathioprine if our goal was really just to prevent antibodies. Um, however, having said that, uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to rock the boat during the COVID uh, endemic because I don't know uh, what is the status of the disease of this gentleman? You know, if we had a recent colonoscopy where the ileum looked beautiful, 
maybe had levels that look perfect, then maybe I'll be more encouraged to drop the dose of azotherapy and to stop it. But if I am not sure what's going on in the colon, I'd rather not rock the boat and keep things the same because what I don't want happening is him flaring and ending up in the emergency room and crowded emergency rooms or being admitted or needing steroids, uh, which can also increase his risk of infection. So I think this is a tough one. And uh, I think we can go, you know, I think Uma brings up excellent points. Um, and at the same time, I feel we, we really, um, you know, I'll be hesitant to make these decisions now. In some, if we did not have COVID going on, this would be the perfect uh, time to reassess the disease and maybe consider picking up azotherapy to minimize the uh, increased risk of lymphoma by using isotherapy long-term and just keeping him on sertoluzumab monotherapy. But for now, I'd rather not rock the boat. So I'm actually looking forward to see what you think, Miguel, and what you're going to uh, tell us about uh, managing IBD in the era of COVID-19. All right, so Eileen's taking a slightly different approach in continuing both uh, UMA is at least decreasing the azathioprine, if not stopping. So yeah, that down arrow for everybody else out there, that means lower the dose. It's just me who's not really savvy on Twitter yet. But anyway, um, I'm going to hold what I would do because I want to keep going through the educational part. And then when we come back to the second poll, I can tell you uh, what I would do with this case. So Let's talk about some key facts. And many of you out there have um, probably seen this before, but SARS-CoV-2, as you all know by now, is a severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. And it's not previously been seen in humans, which is part of the problem with this. There's no immunity to this virus. COVID-19 is also referred to as coronavirus disease 2019 because it was first recognized in 2019. And when it first presented, it presented as a pneumonia of unknown origin in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. And it was felt maybe that it was associated with a wet market or a seafood market. And you're hearing a lot of different comments about maybe where it originated, but that was, that was its first thought. And you can see across the bottom how quickly this spread into a pandemic from December 31st in China, few cases to the first death in uh, January of 11 of 2020, to the first U.S. case January 20th, to the first U.S. death February 6th, and then finally declared a pandemic on March 11th. And today we have over 3 million cases worldwide. So what are some other key facts in terms of transmission? It's, I think, important to recognize that influenza has an R factor, meaning how does this infect other people? in the order of about one to one. That means about one person in a room with another with influenza will get influenza. Obviously with vaccinations, it's less. With uh, COVID-19, this actually has an infections rate of one to three people. So for the person with COVID-19, they're likely to affect at least three other people. The transmission we know are respiratory droplets. Symptomatic individuals are at higher risk for transmission compared to asymptomatic individuals. Contaminated surfaces, especially metal surfaces, can be a problem in terms of having the virus for a number of days. There's some question about fecal oral transmission and the incubation period's about five days. So the reason we tell people to quarantine if they come back or if they've been exposed um, up to 14 days is that by about day five, that's when most people are showing signs of infection. So the clinical course, 80% are mild. Interestingly, as with other viruses, but I think this has been something discussed quite a bit, the loss of smell, anosmia, or taste, dyscusia, fever, cough, fatigue, myalgias, only about 15% are critically ill, and this is what we obviously worry about and hear on the news uh, each night. The clinical deterioration can occur during the first two weeks. It can present as a bilateral pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome. We've all heard about this cytokine storm, so this uh, immune-mediated inflammatory response and disseminated intravascular coagulation. It can cause acute kidney injury, heart failure, strokes, and actually there have been some recent theories on microthromboembolic events that maybe some of the deoxygenation or loss of oxygenation 
are actually related to these pulmonary embolism. Fatality rates, about 2.3%. We know it's higher in elderly, and you can see over the age of 80, up to 15% of the patients um, have a fatality rate. If there are concomitant comorbidities, the death rates are, are uh, higher. If there are no comorbidities, they're lower. So in our patient, James, who has heart disease and some other comorbidities, including diabetes, he's obviously worried about this. In terms of GI involvement, 55% of patients have fecal samples positive for SARS-CoV-2. We don't yet know if this is infective, um, but stools can remain positive up to 28 days later, uh, even um, longer than the respiratory symptoms. 50% of the hospitalized patients have GI symptoms, although there's controversy that goes back and forth daily on the publications, whether GI symptoms prognosticate a worse uh, overall outcome or not. But GI symptoms can include anorexia, diarrhea, vomiting, pain, sometimes preceding upper respiratory infections and sometimes can be the only manifestation. Um, we have seen, and again, this is back and forth, but our ICU patients may have GI symptoms more commonly. So maybe this is a prognosticator. Consider COVID-19 and the patients with IBD who have fever, upper respiratory infection, which I think most of us now probably would consider that. But also think about your patient with IBD who may have an unusual flare or something that's GI related, but not typical of their Crohn's or ulcerative colitis flare, or certainly if they've had an exposure to COVID-19. So the Secure IBD Registry, I think Aileen mentioned this at the beginning. This is a, an international registry. Hopefully, if uh, any of you um, have a patient, you've want, gone to the registry, but it's covidibd.org. Uh, it is updated twice weekly. Over 800 patients, actually, I think it's now 900 in the Secure Registry have COVID-19 and IBD. Risk factors for severe COVID-19 and or death. In the non-IBD population, I mentioned already, over 60. Male gender, interestingly, more than females. History of smoking makes sense. And comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease. What about IBD? And this is what Aileen was referring to, patients who have moderate to severe active IBD. So we don't want our patients flaring with their IBD. We think that may be an independent risk factor for severity of COVID-19. And then steroid use, especially high doses of steroids. There's probably bad with all viruses, but we're worried about this with COVID-19. So there's been an expert consensus. Uh, Uma has been one of the leaders with this, and I've been fortunate to work with her on telemedicine, but ioibd.org, if you go to that, that's a nice, it has a RAND analysis that was recently published in Gastro. But some key take-home points, and these are some key points for you to remember for your patients who have that telemedicine visit with you. IBD does not IBD alone does not increase the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection, meaning getting COVID-19 just because you have IBD. Prednisone over 20 milligrams probably does increase the risk not only of COVID-19, but the more complicated course of COVID-19. And it behooves us not to use long-dose steroids in anybody, but in certainly in this era to try to limit the higher doses. We all have to be practical and we do use prednisone, but we should really try to avoid the higher doses or limit that use. And then finally, um, or sorry, I should say, do not stop or decrease the dose of thiopurines and methotrexate. And we'll come back to UMA because some of the guidelines are suggesting lowering the thiopurine dose as she already mentioned but do not stop biologics or tofacitinib to prevent COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection. So James, our patient, was asking about this. We want to keep him in remission. We don't want to stop his treatment. It's uncertain, though. It's uncertain if patients taking combination therapy like James, an anti-tumor necrosis factor, and thiopurine or methotrexate should reduce the dose of thiopurine methotrexate to prevent infection from SARS-CoV-2. So let's go back to the case and recap.
James, 51-year-old Crohn's, loss of response to infliximab. Last two years, he's been on ceratolizumab, 400 every four weeks, which is the standard dose, and azathioprine, 150 milligrams a day, and he's doing well. He's well controlled. His neighbor has COVID-19. He's very concerned on his telemedicine visit with you that he'll get it, although he doesn't have any respiratory symptoms or GI symptoms. So let's go back. What would you answer? All right, so what do we have? So the pre is blue, the post is green. Uma, I think you've convinced some people. So the bottom line is that um, most out there would continue both. However, after this discussion, um, a larger percentage of you would actually stop or decrease the azathioprine. Uh, nobody would give budesonide. Um, Less of you would actually test before doing anything, and then still some of you don't know. So sorry for those 2% that I didn't impact. Maybe briefly before we go on to my summary slide and then on to the next case, Aileen and Uma, uh, let me come back to you. So Uma, let me start with you again. And um, what do you think about these results? You did a good job. <laughs> Well, I think that it's it's a very nuanced discussion. There's no right answer and you have to individualize to the patient. So if this is somebody who had a hard fart for a remission, you just got him into remission, um, you don't know what his levels are, you don't know what his scope looks like, you may be more hesitant, but 150 milligrams is a lot and he's 51 years old. So if he's been in remission for some time, uh, particularly if I know what his drug levels and his colonoscopy looks like, I would highly... Um, I'm already doing this in my practice. I'm dropping people's azathioprine doses to the, uh, in combination therapy. Let me clarify, combination therapy patients, I'm dropping azathioprine to 50 if they're on more than that. Um, and in some cases, if they have excellent drug levels and absolutely normal colonoscopies, I'll even consider stopping it in older and at-risk patients. So uh, I, think it, I think it makes sense to, in this person who's doing well, and it looks like he's doing well for some time, to drop the dose to 50 milligrams for immunogenicity purposes and continue as sertolizumab. Okay. And Aileen, would you still do the same thing or would you do something differently? And then I'll tell you what I would do and then we'll move to the summary slide and get to the next case. I think uh, Uma put it very well, you know, and somebody who you just put in remission or you're not sure how their colon looks like or uh, you, 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 don't, you don't have a recent uh, anti-TNF drug level, um, I, I might not change things. Uh, I think decreasing the dose of isothyroprine to a, a lower dose to prevent antibodies is, abs is absolutely fair in combination therapy as opposed to a full therapeutic dose. Um, but in, if I have a patient where uh, it was, the disease was difficult to control, I don't have a recent colonoscopy, you know, if they miss an injection, they have some symptoms, if they delay an injection, they have symptoms, then I, I, again, uh, would keep things the same and would not rock the boat. All right, so at, as with most live conferences, whether they're live in person or live virtually, we completely disagree with each other. Um, <laughs> so you heard a split decision. I, I would actually, uh, for this one, I would favor the woman in red. Okay, now I'm <laughs> so, uh, Actually, I would go with what Good one, Miguel, good one. <laughs> Thank you. I would go with what Aileen would do, um, which is actually the patient who's doing very well I wouldn't change anything. Uh, in fact, I had a patient similar to this earlier today, um, but I could not argue with the fact that does the patient really need azathioprine? I think that's Uma's point, but I still would continue both. My fear of them flaring is more concerning to me than my fear of them getting COVID-19 on combination therapy. So the summary of IBD and COVID-19 uh, as you heard, patients with IBD should continue IBD therapy and infusions. We didn't talk about infusions, but we do want our patients to continue infusions. Instructions for patients who develop COVID-19, that was not this case. The patients who's actively infected with COVID-19 and IBD, we do actually recommend holding, stopping the thiopurine, methotrexate, and tofacitinib stopping the biologic therapies. Now, some of these patients are between doses anyway, um, and then restart after the complete resolution of symptoms. And there's some controversy over whether we need negative testing, but I usually go with no fever for 72 hours and asymptomatic. 
Now it gets problematic because some of these people have fatigue for a while, but I'm talking more the, the fevers and respiratory. Having IBD itself is not a risk factor for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and again, as you had seen, the covidibd.org registry, please visit that, enter your cases. So Aileen, that's all I have. Maybe I'll turn it to you for any uh, questions. That was excellent. I think uh, actually this presentation answered a lot of the questions that are coming in and we have amazing questions coming in. So uh, Miguel and Uma, let me ask you this. Uh, if you have a patient with active Crohn's disease or active ulcerative colitis, and um, this is a patient who's biologic naive and you think that biologic will be a good option for this patient, how would you make that decision in this COVID-19 era? What are the factors you'll take into consideration? Would you do something different that you would have done before March 2020? So, I, you know, I think that the goal is to achieve remission. So just like before the pandemic, you want to pick the drug that's best suited for the patient and that's going to be most effective for them and balance risk to benefit. So I think if I have, and I have one right now, if you have somebody with severe ulcerative colitis, failing outpatient steroids, you admit them and you give them infliximab. If you have somebody failing um, infliximab and other agents and tofacitinib seems like the best option, I would start tofacitinib. But if it's an outpatient with moderate to severe disease, I would normally choose a drug that has a better safety profile while still having efficacy. And so in those situations, vetalizumab or ustekinumab would have been my first choice anyway. And so I would um, continue to choose that. I would stay away from azathioprine. Uh, I've never been a big fan of azathioprine. I tend to use more low-dose methotrexate as my combination if they need it. But I also would be very cognizant of the fact that um, you want to avoid long-term high-dose steroids. And so trying to get them on a steroid-sparing agent that's going to be effective for them um, would be the number one priority. Great. Now, I'll just add a little bit to that. And again, for the tweeters out there, keep going. Wow, that really, it's lighting up. Aileen, you've done a wonderful job. I, I agree with uh, Uma overall. I, I will say that my practice has not changed, whether it's outpatient or inpatient. Um, maybe a slight variation from what Uma had said. <clears throat> I do use azathioprine in combination with anti-TNFs. And if I am going to do an anti-TNF, I would start them on azathioprine but I otherwise completely agree with Uma. Whatever is gonna achieve remission is really what we should do. So my practice hasn't changed. I do try to limit high dose steroids, but that's the same as I would have done prior to COVID. This is great, thank you both. Uh, one more question I think that is really interesting. Actually, a couple of questions that are a little bit related. One is if you have a patient with IBD who had an exposure to, uh, someone who is uh, symptomatic for COVID-19, uh, would you stop medication for a few days until your IBD pa patient tests negative? And on the other hand, um, because I think these two questions actually kind of go well together, if you have a patient who, uh, IBD patient on immunomodulator or biologic, and they get infected with COVID-19, why are we stopping these agents since we know that the immunosuppressive effect uh, last more than you know several days or weeks with a lot of these agents. What is your take on that, uh, Miguel? Um, so two great questions. I think the exposure depends on the exposure. And what I mean by that is it within six feet with a person that they were with for a period of time coughing? Well, probably not now because everybody's wearing masks and is very sensitive. But if it's really a high risk exposure, um, I, I, you know, Today, I probably would consider holding and testing. That's such a rare scenario today, though, that I think you're gonna unlikely have that. If it's a patient who has, a person who has a mask, if it's a casual exposure, they've walked by the patient or person, um, I'm not necessarily automatically testing that person and stopping. Um, I am telling them to look out. Now, obviously, the person's riddled with anxiety, so they may on their own stop their medicines, but I wouldn't stop that patient whether you test or not, this gets into a whole other uh, discussion about when we test. 
Um, I may for their peace of mind uh, test uh, at a week, but that's an asymptomatic then. If they haven't had symptoms by seven days, I think it's, um, I think it's unlikely. The, you know, the other question is a very good one. And why are we recommending on this box or this summary box stopping therapy in COVID-19? Um, I can't argue with whoever is asking that. I look at it in two ways. The biologic therapy, since it's a timed event, a subcutaneous injection, an IV infusion, I think if they're due for that infusion or injection, I treat it like somebody who has bad bacterial pneumonia. I might not give it during that time when they're really sick. I might hold off. Now, you could argue for the cytokine storm. Is there some benefit? There are no data on that, and I wouldn't suggest that but I would hold the injection of the infusion if they're due and they're very sick. The thiopurines, very good question. It takes a while for it to wear off. The lymphopenia related to it takes a while to recover. Uh, nonetheless, we don't know how long this person's gonna be sick. And I would take the chance of stopping the thiopurine methotrexate, especially the methotrexate, which may have pulmonary toxicity, but also obviously has some immunosuppressive effect. I would hold both of those. Um, so my turn now. <laughs> As a moderator, I'm going to uh, go next. Um, so this is Charlene. Charlene is a 70-year-old woman diagnosed with ulcerative colitis eight years ago. She has been doing very well uh, for many years now on mesalamine 5-ASA, 4.8 gram per day, and azotherapin at 100 milligram per day. She actually is fairly active, uh, helps uh, taking care of her grandkids, gardens, and so very nice and active lifestyle. However, she comes to you now because for the last six months, she's been having increasing uh, diarrhea and now we got to the point where she has uh, eight food stool bowel movement a day. She wakes up at night occasionally. She has blood uh, streaks with less than 50% of, of uh, uh, those stool. But what really, really bothered her is urgency and she had a uh, huge uh, stool incontinence accident. Uh, she complains of fatigue, she lost weight, she's avoiding to eat so that she doesn't have to run to the bathroom. She's really distressed over her symptoms. It's really affecting her quality of life. She feels she's losing her independence and cannot spend enough time with her grandkids. So her medical history, she has asthma and takes steroid, inhales steroid as needed. She has an anxiety disorder uh, that is treated also. Uh, she does report that uh, she had pneumonia a year ago that did not require hospitalization um, and that resolved with a course of antibiotic. And a couple of years ago, a squamous cell carcinoma uh, was removed uh, and she's been followed by a dermatologist regularly for her skin check. When you examine her, uh, there's mild tenderness in the left lower quadrant area and uh, you send off some labs. And uh, her 60G level is actually therapeutic at 300. Uh, she's very compliant with her medication and her mesalamine and uh, isothiropine. Her fecal caprotectin is elevated at 290. And her stool studies are negative, including a C. diff test that comes back negative. Uh, you perform a colonoscopy and she has disease limited to the rectal sigmoid area with some erythema, friability, and superficial ulceration and you grade her colitis as a Mayo II uh, colitis of the rectal sigmoid area. The biopsies uh, confirm active on chronic disease and are negative for CMV. This is your, your second poll of uh, this evening. All right, so this is uh, um, uh, the results of the poll we got on our Monday Night IBD uh, handle earlier uh, this morning. Uh, and you know, not surprisingly, we had really diverse opinion. Um, one third, around one third would choose to add enema and uh, oral bidazonite uh, for Charlene. 20% uh, would start anti-TNF therapy. And the rest, um, around 50% will either switch to vedolizumab or isokinumab. With overall, a majority of respondents will actually uh, stop azotherapine and azocol and um, azotherapine and 5-ASA and switch to vedolizumab. So a majority of, of uh, respondents will go for vedolizumab. So I'm going to stop here. And Uma, I'm going to start with you since we are the ladies in red tonight. <laughs> How would you approach a patient? This is a 70-year-old woman who's fairly in good health. 
uh, and uh, fairly active. And now with a moderate, uh, moderate to severe, maybe mild to moderate uh, flare, what would you do for her? How would you approach her? How would you treat her? What would you be your choice for her? So Eileen, here on this one, I agree with the majority of people. I would choose betalizumab, um, possibly ustekinumab. Uh, so you're looking, the factors I look at are age. So she's over the age of 60. Um, she's 70 years old. She has a history of pneumonia. She has a history of squamous cell cancer. She, so she has comorbidities. Uh, so you would want to pick something that has a good risk profile. She also has moderate to severe disease despite a therapeutic dose of azathioprine. So there really isn't any benefit to adding enemas or PO budesonide here. I would just move on. You want to give this woman her quality of life back. And so for efficacy and for safety, vetalizumab would be my first choice. I think ustekinumab is not unreasonable. She does have a history of squamous cell cancer and their uh, betalizumab again would be potentially a better choice if it's effective for her and then if that didn't work I would consider ustekinumab a second choice for her. Great, how about you Miguel? How would you approach this patient? What are the things you consider when you're um, it, uh, recommending a therapy in uh, a 70 year old woman or men? I, I agree with them. I mean I think well, first of all, this patient needs to be treated independent of her age. She has active disease. And if you don't treat her, she's probably going to get worse. And then you're going to be faced with does she need surgery or not. So I would definitely treat her. I think vetalizumab or ustekimumab will be very reasonable. Um, I think Vito would probably I'd lean toward that a little bit more. Not because um, necessarily I think that there is a signal that's different between the two of them that we know of in terms of no head to head at this point. But I think both of them are very safe. In fact, um, at DDW, which didn't happen, we actually had a presentation on use to chemimab in elderly patients uh, and found a nice safety signal like with Vito. But I'd probably pick Vito, not go wrong with use to chemimab. All right, so it looks like both of you actually agree with our majority of Twitterati on Monday Night IBD, which is good. It's good to see some agreement from time to time. Yeah. So let, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about IBD in the elderly? Um, you know, our IBD population is aging and we do see uh, IBD, new onset IBD in our older patients. And typically we used to think about IBD in the elderly as a mild form of IBD, but we do see moderate to severe IBD flares and IBD manifestation in our older population. And so it's important to look at this population uh, and the particularity of this population where we are making treatment decision. There's often a function and uh, cognitive status decline. Um, patient might not be able to hear well, see well, they not, might not be, they have decreased mobility. So running to the bathroom um, could be a challenge. There's often a decrease in sphincter tone, so incontinence can be more of an issue. And uh, unfortunately, there's often limited social support. Um, so maybe less capacity to make it to office visit regularly, getting the stool test, getting the colonoscopy, um, you know, uh, uh, getting to the uh, physician office in a timely manner. So all this put together really um, uh, shows that patients who are older and with decreased functional and cognitive status have a decreased ability to handle the burden of the disease. Also, we should think about practical uh, challenges of our patients. So when we're prescribing a treatment, we often think about topical enemas uh, or suppositories as safe options, an easy option, but these might be challenging to do for an older patient, um, either because they live alone or because uh, their sphincter tone is decreased. So these might actually cause more psychological trauma than benefit. And then we have to look at when we're choosing between treatment and Uma and Miguel brought a good point, uh, both vitalizumab and ustekinumab would be a good option for this patient. It's really important to consider what is available to the patient in terms of practical uh, um, uh, factors. Can this patient inject themselves? Or can they drive themselves to an IV infusion center? Do they have somebody who can drive them? So all these need to be taken into consideration when choosing a therapy. On the other hand, it's also important to rule out other pathology that are more common or as common in the older population and that can mimic inflammatory bowel disease. 
So the solitary erectile ulcer of um, older patients who are constipated and who can manifest with overflow diarrhea. Colorectal cancer, ischemic colitis can often be mistaken for IBD. So it's important to rule out these other GI pathology if you're assessing the patient for the first time, but also in your IBD patient who's presenting with unusual symptoms or with a, with a flare. So let's go on next. So what is happening in the real world? How are our older patients with IBD being treated? This is a very nice study that look at this question. And what we can see is that the uh, class of drug that mostly use are the misalamine. 44% uh, of our older population is on misalamine. And this absolutely is appropriate for a patient with mild ulcerative colitis, but not really for patients with more moderate to severe disease or uh, for patients with Crohn's disease. But what is really concerning is how many patients are on chronic steroids. Up to one third of patients above age 60 are chronically on steroid for the management of their inflammatory bowel disease. And it's important to remember that steroid side effects really increase with age. You know, uh, infection, bone loss, increase in blood sugar, hypertension, thinning of the skin, cataract, glaucoma, sleep and mood disturbances, all these can affect in a, uh, you know, an amplified manner our older patients. So again, looking back at the graph here, very few patients actually receive more effective therapy such as thyroid or anti-TNF. So why is that? What are the barriers to using effective therapy in elderly? I think most of us, um, most physicians and most patients are concerned about safety of uh, more advanced therapies. We know that immunomodulator and biologic are associated with an increased risk of infections, mostly upper respiratory infection, pneumonia, and opportunistic infections. And these infections can be particularly severe in the older population and can lead to death. Uh, so there's definitely a concern about the risk of infection with um, more advanced therapies. There's also a concern for the risk of malignancy. We know that thiopurine have been associated with an increased risk of lymphoma. Anti-TNF, probably so too, uh, with a risk close maybe to thi that of thiopurine or maybe a little bit less. Um, both class of drugs have been associated with an increased risk of skin cancer. And finally, there's often a concern of using um, immunomodulator or biologic in patients with a prior history of malignancy. Again, as we're dealing with aging population, they're often going to be a history of not only skin cancer, but maybe breast cancer, uh, colon cancer, et cetera. Um, another factor, uh, another safety factor that can preclude the use of certain therapies are comorbidities. So we typically avoid anti-TNF in patients with unstable CHF. We'll also talk about the risk of venous uh, thromboembolism uh, with the use of dofacitinib. We'll talk about that later. So all this put together really, I think, give this false perception that steroid might be the safer choice uh, than immunosuppressive therapy for our older IBD patients. So safety is one barrier. Another barrier is, can we go back to the prior slide? Another barrier is, uh, what are our goals of care in older patients? We have spent the last several years really defining the goal of care in our younger patients. We're aiming for mucosal healing, preventing complication, preventing surgery, but we need to think more about our goals of care uh, for our elderly, and we'll go over that. And finally, there's very limited data in randomized controlled trial uh, for this patient population. All right, so let's start with infection. The TREAT registry is a registry that looks at potential side effects Bomifliximab, thiopurine, prednisone, and uh, narcotics in patients with IBD. So if we look at the risk of infection with infliximab, uh, if we use infliximab only, that the risk of infection is uh, doubled uh, compared to patients who, with IBD who are not on any of these medications. But look at the risk of prednisone. The risk of infection with prednisone is very similar. It's also doubled. And look at the worst offender is a combination of prednisone and narcotics. This is when really the risk of infection should really high up, up to tenfold compared to patients who are on, not, on none of these medications. So again, it's important to remember steroid, combination of steroid and narcotic are really uh, what we want to avoot for our patients. And this really highlights how important it is 
to put our patient in remission and stable remission so we can avoid the recurrent use of steroids and narcotics. So there's recent updates uh, that was presented on uh, looking at the older population in the treat registry. And here we do see that there is an increased risk of infection in our older patient compared to the young ones uh, with an hazard ratio of 1.6. And most of these infections were, as expected, pneumonia, opportunistic infection, and abscesses. How about other safety signal? Um, this is a really nice study uh, that I often discuss with my patients who are hesitant to start biologic and are really attached to their steroid therapy. Um, in this study, up to 12,000 patients with IBD uh, older than age 60 were assessed. And uh, patients who were on, on anti-TNF were compared to patients who received steroid in a chronic way. So chronic steroid use was defined as being on prednisone for more than 3,000 milligram uh, over a year or on bidesonide for more than 600 milligram for a year. And compared to uh, those that were on steroid, chronically, either recurrent courses or a low dose throughout the year, those that were on anti-TNF did actually much better. There was decreased side effects on, in the anti-TNF group in terms of death, major cardiovascular event, and of course, hip fracture. We do expect to see more hip fracture with a steroid. And overall, there was no difference in risk of cancer in the two groups, the one on anti-TNF and the one uh, on chronic steroid. So really, this study really highlights that chronic steroids should not be a maintenance therapy in our older patients. How about malignancy and biologic? Again, this is a concern since our older patients often have a history of uh, cancer. Can we use anti-TNF uh, if they are needed in our older patients? And um, presenting here two studies. One is uh, for IBD patient with a history of malignancy before starting immunomodulator or, or anti-TNF, and there is no increased risk of recurrence or new malignancy after starting these therapies, even when immunosuppressive therapy was started within five years of the cancer diagnosis. How about breast cancer? This is something that we often see in our uh, female population, and it's often a concern when we're starting anti-TNF. Again, there was no difference in recurrence rate whether women with a history of breast cancer were exposed or not exposed to anti-TNF, and even when anti-TNF was started within five years of breast cancer diagnosis. So overall, if you need to use anti-TNF in your patients, uh, it should be, uh, we, we can. Finally, another safety signal I'd like to discuss tonight is the risk of uh, DVT and PE that was brought up recently around tofacitinib. Uh, the FDA issued a warning uh, about the increased risk of DVT and PE uh, that was seen in patients with rheumatoid arthritis who were treated uh, with a higher dose of tofacitinib. So does this translate to our patients? Well, if you look at the overall incidence of DVT and PE in our UC population, um, it is very similar to what we see with a patient treated with tofacitinib. So, and the, the cases of DVT and PE in patients treated with tofacitinib and who had UC were all patients that had other thromboembolic risk factor. But it's important to remember that those uh, randomized controlled trial and the open extensional trial um, did not include, include a very limited number of older patients. Um, so at this point, uh, in our older population or patients with a uh, risk factor for thromboembolic event, we should take caution for the higher dose of tofacitinib until we have more data. In our younger patient, it might not be an issue with this data that we're presenting. So if we go over all this uh, safety, we talked about antitinib, we talked about tofacitinib. Uh, we also have new mechanism of action uh, over the recent year with vedolizumab and ostekinumab. So how can we put all this safety uh, talk together. And Miguel, you've done a lot of work on that and you published on that. Can you actually help me go over this slide? Well, thank you. So this is, a, first of all, this is not a study specifically. These are a compilation of data 
and along with Ben Click, we tried to put it into a visual cue that was easy for people to understand. So I'll be brief and, and focused on the take-homes from this slide. So the take-homes are that vedolizumab and ustekimumab still seem to be the safest as monotherapy agents. And really, you can look through the pyramid otherwise down. At the very bottom are steroids, which are still the highest risk uh, a drug and medicine that we use. You can see some of the comparison with the ustekimumab and the vedolizumab randomized controlled studies. I won't read all of that, but you can see they're, they're about the same. Again, not a head-to-head -head safety comparison. And the final in the box on the right side that you can see is that under treatment or inadequate treatment is probably one of the biggest risk factors, especially now in COVID-19. As I think Uma said, we really need to keep our patients in remission, uh, independent of the medicine we use, and try to avoid high doses of steroids. Thank you, Miguel. I wouldn't have done it any other way. Okay, so we, we went over uh, the safety profile and other consideration in the elderly. How about efficacy? And it's uh, something that is important to consider in uh, any uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease and including in our older population. And uh, the varsity is the first head-to-head -head, uh, comparison study uh, that looked at patients with moderate to severe UC who were treated with vedolizumab or adalimumab. And uh, this was presented last year and made a big splash in the GI world. And overall, clinical remission, endoscopic improvement, and histological remission uh, were higher in the vedolizumab group compared to the adalimumab. So putting that together for our older patients, um, Miguel, like you mentioned, vedolizumab has a great safety profile, and we might want to avoid uh, anti-TNF in our older patients who don't absolutely need it. This data also show that there might be an advantage in terms of efficacy of vedolizumab over adalimumab. So I'm going to uh, conclude um, before we get to our second uh, poll, or second round of the second poll. What are our treatment goals in the elderly? Again, we define treatment goals in young patients as mucosal healing, preventing surgery, um, preventing uh, hospitalization. And actually our treatment goals in the older patient should be very similar, except that the driver should be mainly clinical remission as opposed to endoscopic or mucosal healing. Uh, what we want is for our patient to have uh, their disease in remission, to have a good quality of life, to prevent steroid use and being in the hospital that can really um, increase their frailty and disability and uh, um, um, put them in a worse shape than before they got into the hospital. And we need to adjust the goal in our patient according to their fitness level, to their functional age, as opposed to their biological age and discuss these goals with our patient and find a mutual and shared common ground in terms of what the goals are and how we can achieve these goals. All right, so let's go back to our poll and I cannot wait to see the result of our audience on the webinar here and see how it compares to our uh, Twitter uh, friends. So again, to recap, Charlene is a 70 year old woman with UC, has been doing well on 5-ASA and isotherapine for eight years Recently, she has a moderate to severe flare with bloody diarrhea, urgency, and weight loss. Her past medical history consists of asthma, anxiety, pneumonia, and squamous cell carcinoma that was removed. And on colonoscopy, she has a Mayo score 2, rectal sigmoid colitis. What would you recommend now? All right, so this is really interesting. Uh, so one, let's start with option number one. So uh, up to 17% felt that adding enema and budesonide would be a good option before we started the discussion. And that really dropped by 1%. This is, uh, this is a nice delta here. And I think the idea is that, um, you know, enemas and budesonide seem to be uh, maybe a safer therapy, but it, it might be just temporizing the issue. Uh, as opposed to treating, treating it. And again, enemas can be very challenging in the older population. Um, Uma, what do you think about option number two, switching to anti-TNF? We started with 20% uh, of our respondent going for anti-TNF in this patient. Um, but after the discussion, it seemed that nobody wants to start this patient on anti-TNF. What is your take on that? So, um 
You know, I, I think that for most of us in this patient population, we would go with something with a better safety profile that still has efficacy. So vetalizumab, ustekinumab would be first choice. But the reality is in the United States, often that decision is not ours. Uh, it may be related to insurance and what the patient can afford. And in that setting, you want the patient to get into remission. That remains the key goal. And an anti-TNF, if that is the only option available to the patient is a reasonable choice. I think though, if you did have options, um, betalizumab or ustekinumab would be a better choice given her comorbidities. I agree, I agree. And um, option number three, switch to ustekinumab. We have some takers here, but the majority will go for vedulizumab. We had 42% uh, going for vedulizumab uh, at first, and then uh, now we have up to 91% going for, for vedulizumab. So I think, Miguel, you have a role to play here with your safety pyramid. Uh, can you comment on that? And also, we're having some questions here. You know, with vedulizumab maybe taking a little bit more time to kick in, would you use vedesonide in addition uh, to vedo uh, at, uh, for this patient? Would you use prednisone? Would you keep her on azathioprine when you start vedulizumab, uh, or would you stop that? Yeah, <clears throat> so I think that, um... You know, I think people are reacting to the safety, and I, I won't repeat what Uma said because I completely agree with everything that she said. Um, in terms of uh, starting Vito and adding a steroid, you know, when you look at the study data, the rapidity of onset of Vito is not actually too bad. I know that that was a kind of an early discussion that we had. Um, it depends on how quickly, coming back to what Uma said, how quickly we can get approval for the medicine. But if we could start Vito today, I would actually just start it without overlapping with steroids if I could, give her a couple doses, see how she does. If I'm delayed in starting it, I think budesonide or um, the budesonide equivalent would be probably my first choice to, to overlap. Um, I would keep her on azathioprine initially, not because I necessarily think it's doing anything, um, but withdrawing it and changing multiple variables. My practice is usually I would overlap by at least three months with Vito or Ustekimumab, not because, again, I'm worried about the immunogenicity as much as, again, not changing variables. And if she does well then, I would pull her off of the azathioprine. This is great. And this, I think, answered some of the questions that came through about whether or not you would use vedulizumab or stikinumab as combination therapy or as monotherapy. And I think most of us are using it as monotherapy, especially if this is the first biologic that a patient is on. Um, how about the last option? Oh, I just wanted to add, it's really yes. important to stop the 5 amino salicylate because it's not adding anything. It adds to polypharmacy and cost is often an issue for the older patient. Absolutely, you bring a great point, something to really remem remember in our older patients, they have so many pills to take that it can get confusing. And often misamine are multiple pills a day, so it can be challenging, but also I'm always worried about people confusing their pills and taking more of a different type of medication they might be on, absolutely, I agree. Any other thoughts before we conclude that? We had some people actually uh, bringing up excellent points. We don't have time to go through those, but again, evaluate the patient for pelvic floor disorder, nutrition is important, really have a, um, a comprehensive approach to our older patients with IBD, some, you know, and also to our younger patients with IBD. But I'm mainly excited that 17%, we're not sure what to do for that case, and we went down to 0%. So I think we all did a good job here, so I'm excited about that. Well, I'm going to summarize this. Uh, so again, special attention to comorbidity, polypharmacy, functional and cognitive status, really assess the risk and benefit of therapies and uh, come into a shared decision with your patient. And this should be um, uh, with what should be in, in mind is really what are our goals of care for a particular patient according to their fitness level. But what's the key message here is do not delay effective and safe therapies, do not delay therapies, and do not rely on steroid as a maintenance therapy for our elderly patient. They are not safer than immunosuppressive therapy and biologic, and now we are very lucky to have a biologic with an excellent safety profile. And of course, we need to optimize physical conditioning and nutrition 
and pelvic floor function like one of our uh, uh, webinar attendee has pointed out, so I appreciate that. All right, so next is going to be our third and final case led by Uma. Uma, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aline. Uh, and this has really been a lot of fun. I've been following along on Twitter and reading all the reactions. Um, this is a great way to interact uh, in the current environment. So Maya is uh, a very typical patient. She's 25 years old. She was diagnosed with Crohn's ileocolitis nine months ago. At diagnosis, she had a severe flare requiring hospitalization. She was started on adalimumab and is currently on 40 milligrams every two weeks plus azathioprine plus prednisone and is now in remission. She's been off prednisone for eight months but continues the adalimumab and azathioprine. And she had a colonoscopy a month ago that showed she was in endoscopic remission. So she had no visible evidence of uh, inflammation on her colonoscopy. Today she presents because she is interested in family planning. You can tell this is not a San Francisco patient because she's 25 instead of 45. Um, but that's what we're going to talk about today. So she shares her concerns with you. Um, the risks of taking IBD medications for the fetus. So this is a common concern for mother and for provider. The risk of flare if she stops medications while pregnant. And then she wonders if she can stop her IBD medication and use prednisone if she flares, which she had heard about um, from one of her uh, physicians. Okay, so let's take the poll. Maya is a 25-year-old woman with Crohn's disease. She's on adalimumab plus azathioprine. She's in endoscopic remission. She wants to have a baby, and she's concerned about risks of IBD medications on the fetus and wants to stop medications. What would you recommend to Maya? Okay, so this is what our Twitter audience had uh, selected. And um, it's interesting. So they said 45% would continue with adalimumab and azathioprine. Um, about a quarter, a little more than a quarter, would keep the adalimumab and stop azathioprine. 24% would hold adalimumab in the third trimester. I must think that those are our XUS uh, participants, and some would stop both and use prednisone if she flares. So, um, Aline, let me ask you, how would you counsel this patient? Well, uh, Uma, I learned from the best. <laughs> you you uh, really led the work uh, uh, for us to understand how to best manage uh, our pregnant women with IBD. And, you know, the main uh, take-home message uh, that I discuss with my patient is one, they need to be in remission before um, starting family planning and remission means off steroid. And this patient has been off prednisone for eight months and doing well. She's also in endoscopic remission, which is fantastic. So I'm very confident that she's going to do well during her pregnancy. I would keep both therapies. Uh, this is somebody that presented with a severe form of Crohn's disease that required her to be admitted, that required her to be on combination therapy to get well. And uh, what I don't want to be doing is causing a flare before uh, she starts her family planning. Having said that, one of the things that would help, I think, is checking maybe at the Lumimab level and see where we are, see if we have any antibodies, uh, and really kind of optimize the therapy before pregnancy. Um, you know, if her adalimumab level are really good and there's no antibody, I might consider stopping isotherapine, not because I'm concerned about safety of isotherapine in the context of pregnancy, but just really to simplify the regimen. But at this point, only nine months from a diagnosis and a flare. And if she really wants to have babies right now, uh, I will keep her on both. Um, you know, as she's planning for her pregnancy and during her pregnancy and throughout the pregnancy. Great, all great points. And again, you bring up the key thing is that healthy mother, healthy baby, it's important to have her disease under good control. Miguel, what is your take on this? I agree completely. Um, and I think the, the point that Aline made about she's only been diagnosed nine months, she's been on steroids, she was in the hospital. Those are some bad prognostic uh, signs. I definitely continue it. I no longer hold the monoclonal antibody in the third trimester I treat through, and I imagine you're going to get to that, but I would continue to both of the treatments throughout the pregnancy. 
Great. And, you know, I, I would I would agree. I think it really depends on the patient. If it's somebody who really has a sustained remission, say this is two to three years from now, she's had solid adalimumab levels in remission, that's somebody I would consider stopping the azathioprine and having monotherapy. And this person, she was just in the hospital nine months ago. I think I would be more cautious uh, and continue her current therapy. I wouldn't use full dose azathioprine. I would probably go down to 50 milligrams if she had great levels because we're using it for immunogenicity, but I would most likely continue both as the majority of people have suggested. Great. So um, I heard a lot when I first started uh, practice um, many years ago now, uh, uh, patients coming in saying, well, you know, I was told that I could just stop my medications and if I flare, I'll use prednisone. Prednisone has a lot of side effects, as we know, and in the pregnancy registry in Piano, which is a national prospective pregnancy registry of about 1,700 women across the U.S., when women were on steroids during pregnancy, they were more likely to have preterm birth and more likely to have low birth weight. That's expected as uh, patients with, who are on prednisone have disease activity, and it's very hard to separate the two. But we did see a near threefold increase in gestational diabetes, which adds to the complications of pregnancy. There was no increased risk in congenital malformations, though, and the whole um, thought about cleft lip, cleft palate with steroid use in the first trimester was based on older studies and, and more recent large scale studies, not just in IBD patients have shown that that is not the case. So uh, in Piano, we looked at over 1500 patients who've delivered and who've been analyzed and uh, the rest are still ongoing in their pregnancy. We looked at the use of biologics, azathioprine or a combination um, during pregnancy versus the offspring of mothers with IBD who did not use those medications. And there was no difference in the rate of congenital malformation, spontaneous abortion, preterm birth, low birth weight, infant infections to one year, because we do know the drugs cross the placenta, or developmental milestones to one year. So when Piano started in 2007, we were really worried about congenital malformations. And then the more we learned about what these therapies did, um, these other variables that we looked at became more and more important and they remain very reassuring. So um, monoclonal antibodies or biologics are antibodies. That means that they have a FC component except for sertilizumab, which is just a fragment, but the other ones have an FC component, which is grabbed by the FCRN on the placenta starting at least around week 14 and antibodies are pulled across the placenta from mother to baby. That's how mother transfers immunity from mother to baby. And for the first six months of life, that's how the baby fights infections. Since these drugs are antibodies, they get pulled across as well. And 80% of that transfer occurs in the third trimester. So we published our experience with infliximab, adalimumab, and sertilizumab. And uh, you can see in these patients that the um, infliximab levels in the babies were significantly higher than the mothers. It was about 2.4 times maternal levels. Adalimumab was about 1.4 times maternal levels, but sertilizumab um, had very minimal transfer, again, because there's no active transfer since it was missing the FC portion. And it can take up to six to nine months for the baby to fully clear antibody. So what does that mean to the baby? So we, um, one of the things in the prior slide that we looked at were in infant infections. And we saw that there was no difference in infant infections based on level of uh, biologic at birth. This study from the French National Health Database also looked at their experience, this was retrospective, and they looked at 8,700 IBD pregnancies of which 1,457 were on TNFs. Uh, in France uh, and in much of Europe, the practice was often to stop the TNF around 22 weeks gestation to try to avoid transfer of antibody. And in the first row, you can see that if anti-TNF was used in the third trimester, there were increased maternal complications and infections, uh, which would be the same if the woman was not pregnant, you would expect more, uh, there are more infections with TNF than not on TNF. However, the child, um, did not show any increase in infections in that first year. If there was severe disease, the mother again had increased um, complications as expected. 
when they stopped TNF, they had a higher rate of relapse in the third trimester and the very bottom bar, disease relapse in the third trimester. When mother relapsed in the third trimester, there were more maternal complications, but for the first time, we're also seeing more infections in the child and more in-hospital infections. So their message is very clear and the message that we expressed from the beginning, which is that the mother needs to be in remission through pregnancy. When the mother continues TNF, we're not seeing an increase in infections in this study or the piano registry, but when the mother has a disease relapse in the third trimester, that is when we're seeing complications. So we do not recommend stopping the drug in the third trimester. We also looked at response to vaccines. And if the mother was on a biologic or immunomodulators, the infant's response to tetanus and Haemophilus influenza B was similar to um, offspring of IBD mothers not exposed to those medications. So we do recommend that uh, offspring of mothers with IBD get all their vaccinations on schedule except for live vaccines in the first six months of life. In the United States, the only live vaccines we give in the first six months is rotavirus, so that should be skipped. In other countries, they do give BCG vaccine, but that should be held till six months of age. And in some high prevalence areas, they're giving measles at six months, which is fine for this group of patients, uh, but not before six months. So let's go back to our case. So it's a 25-year-old woman with Crohn's disease on adalimumab and azathioprine um, in endoscopic remission, wants to have a baby, concerned about risks of IBD medications on the fetus, and wants to stop medications. What do you tell her? Okay, so um, great. I think uh, we, we all seem to be on the same page with many of us choosing, 90% of us choosing to continue adalimumab and azathioprine during the entire pregnancy. And I'm glad to see that the 13% who weren't sure now have made a choice. And um, the 5% who would still uh, stop azathioprine, I don't think that's unreasonable in somebody who's been in a sustained remission. And if she was on full dose azathioprine, I would uh, reduce her dose to 50 milligrams if she had good drug levels. I think in the interest of time, I will just move on to the next slide and then we'll take some questions and discuss with our panelists. So Maya remained on adalimumab and azathioprine and gave birth to a healthy baby boy. She wants to breastfeed, but the pediatrician told her to switch to formula because her milk can be dangerous for the baby. She is devastated. And I think this scenario illustrates the importance of pregnancy and IBD being approached as a multidisciplinary uh, care uh, regimen. You need the pediatrician, the obstetrician, the maternal fetal medicine specialist, the nutritionist, the lactation specialist, the gastroenterologist, everybody needs to be on the same page. So um, Maya is 26. She's been on TNF, anti-TNFs throughout her pregnancy in remission, and the pediatrician told her not to breastfeed to switch to formula. Great. So from our Twitter poll, 85% um, of people recommended keeping adalimumab and breastfeeding. And that is certainly uh, what I would recommend. I do want to point out that pumping and dumping is not something you ever need to do. Remember that as um, blood con as serum concentrations in the blood drop, then the gradient in breast milk changes and the medicine gets pulled out of the breast milk. So there isn't a reason uh, to pump and dump in this patient or for most medications. So there are many benefits of breastfeeding for the mother and child. Um, you see a reduced risk in the child of infections, of immune-mediated disease, obesity, um, SIDS, necrotizing enterocolitis. And for the mother, you see a reduction in type 2 diabetes, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and postpartum depression if uh, breastfeeding is not stopped early. This uh, study on thiopurines and breastfeeding was done in 2011, but was well done. And they looked at samples at multiple time points. And they found that the concentration in breast milk peaked in the first four hours after drug intake, but the maximal dose going to the baby is 0 0.0075 milligrams per kilogram. So a very small amount. So I recommend to my mothers that they can continue to breastfeed if they can wait four hours after taking their medication to breastfeed, that's great. But even if they did it within those four hours, they are fine. And there's no need to pump and dump in this setting. 
We also published from the piano registry, um, the impact of biologics on breastfeeding. And you can see we listed multiple uh, biologics here and the amount that transfers in breast milk and the transfer usually occurs within the first few days after dosing is really trivial. So remember when we are talking about serum drug concentrations at trough, you're looking for levels of three or seven or 10. The maximum we're seeing is 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So truly a fraction of uh, the amount that you would see in a person getting drug. And we correlated um, transfer into breast milk with disease, uh, with other factors and found that breastfeeding while on biologics does not affect infant growth developmental milestones and infection rates. So we do recommend that they breastfeed. So let's go back to our poll. Um, Maya is a 26 year old woman with Crohn's disease. She's been on anti-TNF inhibitor throughout her pregnancy um, in endoscopic remission. The pediatrician told her to switch to formula. What would you recommend to Maya now? A hundred percent. All right. Um, so I will ask uh, Miguel, what do you recommend to your patients and do you differentiate amongst the biologics uh, with respect to whether you continue them in pregnancy and whether, what you recommend for breastfeeding? I agree with the poll. Um, so I would qualify, and I think you said this already very clearly, the monoclonal antibodies, I do not differentiate in preconception, conception, during pregnancy, after pregnancy, and in breastfeeding, meaning I continue those throughout. Um, tofacitinib uh, is the one that I will hold in anticipation of pregnancy uh, and not start in breastfeeding, although again, I wonder about that based on some of the data that you've presented at other meetings. Um, but at the same time, I think, no, the biologic monoclonal antibodies, I treat the same, and I agree with this uh, answer. Great. And so tofacitinib, I would not continue during breastfeeding, and I would like to avoid during pregnancy just based on animal data. And it's not a monoclonal antibody, so it will cross in the first trimester. Um, right. So that, that's a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> Aline? I'm excited about the, the answers here. It's seems that you did a fantastic job of convincing everyone um, that it is important to save the breast milk, first of all, uh, for anybody who has uh, breastfed a child and who know how precious the breast milk is, this is not something to be wasted. It's very important for mom and child to bond if the mother choose to breastfeed. And it is it's an important uh, factor in overall baby's health. And um, for biologic or immunomodulator like uh, thiopurin, um, isotherapin, or uh, 6MP, I, I, I do encourage our mom to breastfeed. I do not stop the medications. And um, I um, agree with our audience. Uh, so I'm excited to see these numbers. One of the things I want to point out is that often my patients uh, are concerned about isotherapin or 6MP during pregnancy because of the label. Um, when they Google uh, the drug and it come back as a, um, you know, not recommended during pregnancy. And um, we have numerous data showing and your piano uh, data showing that being on isotherapin or 6MP does not increase the risk of negative pregnancy outcome or congenital malformation. So it's very important to differentiate what's on the label, all the label, and what we have in terms of data. Exactly. That's why the FDA changed the label, because people were misusing the A, B, C, D, and X. So now it's just descriptive, and um, that made people feel more comfortable about using these medications based on available data. I think there's a summary slide still. Yes. Okay. So for IBD and pregnancy, preconception planning and education is key. So this is really important. When I see my patients, um, even if they're not considering pregnancy, male and female, I always tell them, when you're thinking about getting pregnant, come talk to me first so that we can plan and we can make sure everybody's on the same page. This is multidisciplinary, um, both during fertility, um, during the pregnancy, and during the delivery and the postpartum. You want all their providers on the same page. Uh, for immunomodulators and biologics, they do allow patients with IBD to achieve remission, which, it, which allows them to uh, be able to have a pregnancy and have a healthy pregnancy. And adverse events are not greater than in unexposed pregnant women, and they can be continued through pregnancy and the postpartum. For children, um, 
Children exposed to biologics and azathioprine uh, have excellent developmental milestones compared to unexposed children. And if they were exposed to a biologic except sertolizumab during pregnancy, they should not get live vaccines for the first six months of life. All other vaccines can and should be given on schedule. And then for resources, I'll refer you to the AGA IBD Pregnancy Care Pathway, which was a joint statement between the AGA and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. So the OBs and the GIs are all on the same page. And the patient-facing website for that is ibdparenthoodproject.org. And if you have a pregnant patient with IBD, feel free to refer them to Piano. We would love to have them, piano at ucsf.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Uma. That was excellent, and we're getting tons of questions, so I hope you're ready. Um, yeah. First question, uh, do you, you know, what can you tell us about the pharmacokinetic changes of biologic during pregnancy? Does the level of anti-TNF or isotherapine change uh, during pregnancy? Uh, do you check for levels uh, during pregnancy? What do you do? So, um, for is, so there have been a lot of studies looking at this. Um, there's one from Cynthia Sal that suggested that infliximab levels may go up during pregnancy. There was also one uh, from a European group that used a modeling exercise. I think it was Casper Steenholtz group that suggested um, the levels of infliximab but not adalimumab go up during pregnancy. I think some of the issues with that is they didn't always check the level before pregnancy. It wasn't clear if they were increasing dose based on pregnancy weight, which I don't do. I usually continue based on the dose they were on before. Um, but I have to say we do check second trimester levels in patients and we have not had felt the need to cut down on the majority of patients dosing during pregnancy. They seem to be within an appropriate range. That's great. Um, another question, how do babies do in terms of milestone? Babies that were exposed to biologic in utero, do you have data for us on that? Yeah, so we have um, that data from Piano and uh, we hope that it will be published soon. But we look, we use something called the ages and stages score, uh, which if you have kids and you go to the pediatrician, you have to fill it out every time. Uh, the ages and stages is a nationally validated score and compared um, when you compare within the IBD group and piano, the exposed and unexposed, there is no difference in achieving developmental milestones based on whether they were on azathioprine or biologic or combination therapy. When you compare it to the national average, the developmental milestones in the IBD group was significantly higher for most categories. But the biggest predictor of developmental milestones is socioeconomic status and the patients in piano come from IBD centers. So that's why it's a little bit unfair. So when you compare within the piano cohort, everybody, they do just as well exposed versus unexposed compared to the national population, they do better. This is great. Miguel, I don't want you to feel left out when we're talking about pregnancy because men, uh, gastroenterologists also treat pregnant women. So the, this next question is, if a, if a child is exposed to anti-TNF in utero and later develop IBD and need anti-TNF themselves, can we use it? Is there a, do they, are they at risk of developing antibodies? Do we have data on that? What can we tell the parents or the child? So, so first of all, I thought you were gonna say that um, men who get pregnant, and I'm not sure where you're going with that, but I'm glad you qualified. Um, so, so based on, and again, I, I'm going to let Uma chime in. Uh, currently, they are eligible and able to get an anti-TNF later in life if they develop IBD and had received an anti-TNF or the mother had received an anti-TNF. So I wouldn't hesitate using an anti-TNF. Now, the world of IBD treatment is changing. So somebody in utero today, 10 to 15, 20 years from now, uh, maybe look very different, but I would not hesitate using an anti-TNF in that patient. Yeah, I, I would agree, Miguel. We published our first patient from Piano where the baby, the boy, the child was 10 years old and he had been exposed to infliximab in utero and then needed him, it himself as a 10 year old and levels were checked pretty much before every dose because we weren't sure if he would reject it, he would be tolerant to it. 
So he needed accelerated dosing. So he's on 10 mg per kg every six weeks, but he responded to it and he is in remission and we published that in Gastro. This is fantastic. We have a lot of questions, so I don't know if we're ready for a little potpourri of uh, questions. Do we have? All right, let's see. Uh, oh, the pressure of choosing the right question. All right, so this is uh, actually a question that is often a dilemma in my practice. So I would love to hear you, both of your opinion on that. If you have an elderly person who has been on azathioprine for a very long time and has been stable on that, um, and we, we're concerned about the increased risk of lymphoma uh, in, in the older patients, especially in men. What do you recommend? Do you stay on that? Do you change? Do you switch? What do you, how do you discuss and how do you approach things with patients? And I would love to hear both of your thoughts. If it's somebody who has had severe IBD, they're on azathioprine, now they're elderly in remission, honestly, I'm not changing that patient. Now, the caveats are we know that there are higher rates of non-melanoma skin cancers, so I do tell them that, and I caution them, and we do have a discussion about that. Um, similarly, the infectious infection rates and the malignancy, specifically lymphoma rates, so we need to keep it into account. Um, I guess I've seen too many IBD patients over time who've gone bad by switching or stopping when they were doing well, that I would continue, but I completely understand the desire and probably the majority of gastroenterologists would decrease, stop, and try to switch to something else, which I cannot argue with. Yeah, I think um, I have on the one hand a fear of rocking the boat, and on the other hand, I you know, do have concerns about azathioprine in our older population. But, you know, the I do try to give them the lowest dose that works for them. So if they're on 2.5 mg per kg and I can get away with half that dose, I will do that. And you have to remember for a lot of older patients, if they require a biologic, they often cannot afford the copay. And that becomes the reality of treating the patient in front of you. And so azathioprine is inexpensive, it's effective you, and for some people. If it's effective for them, give them the lowest possible dose, monitor them closely. Um, but I also do look for any opportunity to switch. All right, thank you both. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, this is a really great discussion and I wanna summarize all the cases with uh, four SMART goals, which are action that you can use in your practice uh, to improve the care of our IBD patients. So one, during the COVID-19 endemic, ensure that your patient remains on the therapy that's keeping them in remission, minimize steroid use, uh, but please keep your patient on the therapy that's keeping them well. Uh, choose safe and effective therapies for older patients, keeping in mind uh, their functional status, uh, comorbidities, polypharmacy, and uh, other uh, factors that we discussed today. And finally, when treating women with IBD of childbearing age, uh, make sure you have the discussion about pregnancy ahead of time, and they need to be in remission before pregnancy, on safe therapies before pregnancy, throughout pregnancy, and allow them to have a uh, post-pregnancy, um, uh, healthy post-pregnancy, so they can take care of themselves and their children. Alrighty, so we got a lot of questions, and if we did not get your questions, uh, I'm going to spend the next few minutes after uh, we close off answering them, and uh, we did not abandon you, but um, for now, I would like to thank uh, my panel, my good friends, uh, Uma and Miguel, for joining me today. Thank you so much. This was a great program. This is the best it can be with the physical distancing. I did feel the connection. Miguel, we're going to get you wearing red next time. I know we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I really want to thank uh, our friends at CME Outfitter for the assistance in developing today's program. This was supposed to be a live meeting at DDW, and they did just a fantastic job transitioning to this national webinar. And uh, again, thank you all for keeping it engaging. And thank you for those who joined us on this webinar or on Twitter and interacting with us and give uh, you know give us your input and uh, sharing your questions, your concern, and taking our polls. So thank you. And I really recommend if you haven't done so now during this, get on Twitter, follow our amazing uh, Uma Mahadevan and Miguel Regera. Follow us on Monday Night IBD for more discussion and more interaction. And please don't forget to visit, visit the CME Outfitter website 
to access this presentation, other resources, and complete your CME evaluation. So stay safe. Thank you again for providing the best care to your IBD patients. And good to see you all. <laughs>